All right, we are in week two of Loved and Sent. It's an incredible series built around two words that are really simple. They're only a couple of letters each, easy to remember, loved and sent, but they form the focus of who we are in this world. This week, we have a couple of the books available. Uh, they're out on the, uh, on the uh, Connect table out there. If you'd like one, feel free to grab one and read it uh, this week, or you can always find some on Amazon, and we may have some more copies next week if they all get taken as well. But here we are in week two, and we are focusing today on the first person of the Trinity. Who really is God the Father? Now, that sounds all theological. We're going to focus on the first person of the Trinity today. Well, what we're really talking about is who is God? When you say God, who are you talking about? Who are you talking to? When you say God, do you realize that you're actually talking to somebody? I'll bet you don't half the time. But half the time you say God, it's just kind of an exclamation. It's just a word you use to fill in or to say an emotion that you're feeling. But every time you say the word God, you are talking, speaking with the creator, designer, perfecter of the entire universe. So we need to know who he is and what he's all about. That's what we're going to focus on today because when we know who God really is, then we can learn who we really are. And when we know who we really are, then we can know what we are called to do here in this world. Hence the idea of being loved and being sent. So, Let's start with that. Who is God the Father? What is he all about? Well, right here in Loved and Sent, this is how Jeff puts it. God the Father does these three things. He is the creator, he is the designer, and he is the Father. All right, the creator. We know what creators are, right? They create stuff. Designers design how things are supposed to work. And do we all know what a father is? Well, we all know what a father should be at the very least, right? This has been a difficult subject over the last generation. Do we talk about fathers in the same way that we used to when so many people have not necessarily experienced positive fatherhood? Well, I think this is kind of the antidote to that. This is the place that we go to start to learn about who a father is, what fathers are called to do, and the basic role model that fatherhood has in our life. So that's a part of what we're going to talk about today. But these are these three things. God the Father is the creator, the designer, and the father. Now I mentioned before that we're talking about the first person of the Trinity. Anybody? We have some confirmation age students here today. Uh, The Trinity. What is, how would you describe the Trinity? Anybody have, I'll take, I'll take uh, all kinds of answers from the crowd. It's all right. Miles, what you got? The Trinity is God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very good. So do we believe that there are, there are three gods that we believe in? No. We believe that there is one God. This is the triune God, the God in three persons. There are three persons, but there is one God. So does that mean each person, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are only a third God? No, it doesn't. Good job. Thank you all. You all passed confirmation officially today. You're, you're able to do it. No, it means that there is one God, 100% God, and all of these persons, all three of them, are 100% God. Does the math work? No. No. Absolutely not. This is something that we believe on faith. We believe this on faith, that there is one God in three persons, which all of these persons are fully God. Now, why do we believe it? Well, because we trust the source that we have. We trust the scriptures. We trust how it's been passed down to us throughout all the centuries. And the scriptures from the very beginning testify that there are three persons, that there is a triune God. Because when God the Father created everything, guess who was hovering over the waters, making it all good? It was the Holy Spirit himself. And who was there from the beginning of creation as the solution to the problem that was going to come? It was God the Son. It was Jesus. They were all there from the very beginning. They always have been. They always will. One God in three persons. So today we are focusing on the first person, the first person of the Trinity, God the Father, whose unique work, whose unique contribution is to be the creator, the designer, and the Father. Does that make sense? Tracking with me so far? All right, you're going to learn something today. But it's going to be a little interesting. We're going to get to that in just a moment. All right, so what does it mean that he was the creator? How does, how does this work, being the creator of all things? Well, we go back to the original story, right? Do you know pieces of the original story? That when God created everything, there was nothing before it? 
that he created everything out of kind of darkness, out of a void, and everything that we see today, the whole universe, the stars, the planets, the, the water, the sun, the earth, the people, the animals, he created it all. And when he did so, he created people, and he put them in a garden, the Garden of Eden, a beautiful, lush garden. I kind of picture it, you know, kind of I don't picture it as a pretty garden. You know what I mean by pretty garden? Like manicured, like how some people are treating their yards right now here in Chicago. Because finally our grass got green and everybody's been outside, it's been warm. And there are some people who are meticulous with their yards. Like so much so like taking little clippers out to the grass to make sure that every single blade is all the same height. You have people in your neighborhood like that. And if you don't, that means that you probably are that person, right? So that is not how I picture the Garden of Eden. I picture the Garden of Eden more like this, as some place that's a little bit wild, that's a little bit untamed, where there's areas to explore, where everything hasn't been perfectly curated and controlled. Because God, to me, God the Father, the one who creates out of nothing, who creates things where there wasn't before, just with a single word, he is able to live in the midst of what we see as chaos because he knows that there is order that we can't even see. When God sees what we see as a mess, he doesn't see it that way. Think about that for a moment. When we see a mess, God doesn't see it that way. When you look at your life now and the things that you think and the way that you relate to others and you see a mess, what does God see in that? I'm here to tell you today that I don't think that he sees the mess that you see. I don't think he sees that at all. Because the creator, the designer, the father of all things, well, he has a way. He has a way about him. Let's, let's see what that way is truly all about. In the beginning, Genesis 1 and 2, God created everything, right? And how did he create it all? Again, these are confirmation questions and answers. We're going to get back to it. He created it all through speaking, through his word, through exactly what he said. He said, let there be light, and there was light. Like, with his, his what he said actually happened. Can you imagine what life would be like if we could do that? If what you, parents, if what you said actually happened, what would life be like? It would be, it'd be too easy, right? It'd be just too easy. If everything you said, your kids always did. But that's who God is. That's what this creator God is all about. That's what God the Father is all about. It says in Genesis 2 that the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. So God didn't create things just to create them because he was bored, all right? He created them for a purpose. At the very beginning, people were created, men and women were created to work together for a purpose in the world. He was tending and watching over the garden. Was he manicuring all the lawns to make sure they were perfect and controlling them? No, he was He was there to tend them, to make sure that they lived well, right? People's original purpose, men, women, humanity, was to live in this world and make sure that the rest of the world lived well. That is who God made us to be. That is who he created us to be. That's why you have this sense of compassion in your heart and in your lives that you exist in order to help others live well. God has put that in you. He has put it in everybody from the very, very beginning. So this creator God creates everything. He gives people, humanity, an incredible purpose. This is part of who God the Father is. Well, but there's more to him. That's not all that there is. You see, here in this picture, we have the hands of a potter, right? And this clay thing that I don't even know what it's going to be yet. But in the nimble fingers of this this creator is a design in mind. He's not just creating anything. He's creating something. There's a difference, right? Behind... If you've ever sat at a potting wheel and and wondered, what am I going to create? You'd better get a pretty good idea in your head before that thing starts spinning. Because what's going to happen if you get off just a little bit? Have we all seen these shows yet? Isn't there a great pottery show on right now? Like there's like a, a, a reality show where the potters compete and they get kicked off. Have you seen this yet? It's pretty fantastic. Uh, anyway, uh, what happens if they don't know what they're doing when they start is the clay starts and then it wobbles. And what happens when it starts wobbling? 
it just, it's useless. It, it just flattens. It falls over. God the Father has a design for his creation. He knows what it needs to be, and he has built it with all the tools and the things that it needs to do what he calls it to do. We see this again still in who God has made us to be. Now, I'm going to take you, there's lots of places in the Bible we can go to see this, but I'm going to stay in the Old Testament, I'm going to stay original, and we're going to go right to, well, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were made to show us the design for humanity. Now, you may think with what you know about the Ten Commandments, they all say, you shall not, you shall not, you shall not, and they get a little bit oppressive sometimes. I mean, I don't think this one's oppressive, you shall not murder, that show one should be easy, right? But then it gets to like, you should not bear false witness, you should not lie about others, which means, well, can I tell a small lie to make somebody feel better? How does that work? And it gets a little dicey at that point, right? Why do we have those? Why did God feel that it was good to give us commandments to follow? It's because he's a designer. Because he has designed the human experience in this world to have boundaries. Because remember what our purpose is from the very beginning? Our purpose is to live and to take care of all living things, to help things live. So he puts boundaries on us because we are fundamentally, at our core, broken. This was the big story in the Garden of Eden, the reason why we don't still live there. It's because Adam and Eve walked away from God. They said, I want to be like God. I want to do the things like God. I'm going to eat this fruit from the tree that I'm not supposed to so that I know everything that God knows. And they were not allowed to live in perfect relationship with God again. They broke it. And so we live with the consequences of that sin. Each one of us today, we are born in such a way that we will make mistakes. We cannot get away from it. So God kept our original purpose. He didn't just scrap us and start over again. He said, no, your purpose is still to live in this world and to take care of it and to help things live and help things grow. So I'm going to give you boundaries within which you need to live. And the very first thing that he says, the first thing that encapsulates all the other things, the first thing that if you don't get this right, you're not going to get the rest of them right, is simply this. I am the Lord your God. Do not make anything more important than me. Have you heard that before? I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods, right? Well, I don't have other gods. I believe in the one true God. I believe in the triune God. But have you made other things more important than him? Have you put things in your life that take precedence over God and who he is in your world? Well, that's a little tougher question, but that's exactly what he's saying. He has designed us and given us boundaries and fences within which to live because when we live within those boundaries, which are pretty, pretty wide for us, we live in such a way to help the world grow. We help it live. So keep God at the center of who you are. Don't make anything more important than me. And then he goes into a list of things that we shouldn't do, like murder. We need to obey our elders We need to not murder. We need to not steal things. We need to not lie about things. We need to not commit adultery. All these things, if you look at other people's lives, you can see how they've ruined other people's lives when we go across those fences. But what God is calling us to do today is to see how in our lives we can stay within those fences. We are designed to stay within those boundaries so that we can live out our purpose. When we stay in those boundaries, we are showing just who God has made us to be. We are showing that we are greatly and dearly loved and that we value loving the world more than loving ourselves. God is the creator. God the Father is the creator. And he is a designer. He has designed this experience for us. We learn about this through his scriptures and we trust it because when we follow it, we know that it actually does what he says it does. The last thing that we know about God the Father is exactly what we say about him. He is a father. God is a father. He is our father. And every week at church, we say our father. We follow it up by a prayer, right, that Jesus taught us. Jesus said that as we come to God, we call him father. Jesus went to him as father all the time. This idea of God being a father just permeates 
all of our experience with God. Why is that so? Why is that so? Why would fatherhood be such an important metaphor for our relationship with God? Well, there's a couple reasons. The first of which is that it reminds us that the God who created the entire universe, the God who designed the entire human experience, wants to have a very personal relationship with you. You would think that the God who did everything just really wouldn't care about one person, right? What's, what's the point when he can care about millions and billions of people? Why would he care about just one? In knowing God as the Father, he reminds you every single time that he cares specifically about you. He cares about your hurts and your pains, the way that you suffer. He cares about your, the things that you're joyful about. He cares about your gifts and your skills. He cares about the resources that you have. He cares about who you are toward other people. He cares about everything about you. He really does. And that is an astounding way to live. When you wake up in the morning and you realize that the creator of the universe who said, let there be light and there was light, wants to walk with you through your day, it starts to give new meaning to who you are and what you do with your life. Some things just fall away that aren't quite as important and other things like living within these fences that God has given us so that we might bring life to the world become way more important because you start to see an eternal perspective within the very real, very tangible things that you do. Why would you talk to your neighbors? This is a real question, right? We live in suburbia. You literally have no need to talk to any of your neighbors. You can drive directly into your garage, close the door behind you, and stay in your house. You can stay in your backyard that has tall fences and not talk or know anybody. It is possible, isn't it? And you could live for years like this. But if you view your life as a way to bring life to others, as a way to bring the blessings of God into your neighborhood, that makes no sense. It makes no sense. God as a father reminds us that he is with us through everything, that he is with you specifically through everything, and that he acts as a father. Now, this is interesting because in the Old Testament, what people would say to themselves every day, like a mantra, is simply like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Every day they would say this to themselves. It's like a prayer, like a, like a mantra. And what it means is that there is only one God. Sure, that's what it means on the outset, but did you see this is capitalized, the Lord. And in our English Bibles, we don't get this the right way because, well, because it wasn't proper to say what this really meant. But we're going to say it today because it's okay. In the Old Testament, when God, when God the Father showed up to Moses in this burning bush, he revealed himself to be the one true God of Israel. And when he did that, he told Moses his name, like his first name. He wanted to be on a first name basis with Moses and all of his people from then on. And the people thought that was too personal, so they couldn't actually say the first name, so they used a euphemism for it. And even in our Bibles, that's the way that it is. But however, this means, hear, O Israel, that Yahweh, Yahweh, this name here, is our God. Every day, reminding yourself that the God of all things, God the Father, has given us his first name to know him by, to be understood by it, to pray to him by, that he is our God, that he is real, and that he wants a personal, intimate relationship with us. So, if this is what God the Father is all about, what does this, I guess, what does this mean with fatherhood? Let's get to that a little bit. Being a father is a difficult, difficult thing. Now, just because I'm talking about fatherhood does not mean I'm ignoring motherhood. We're going to get to that in about two weeks, right? One, two, three weeks. We've got three weeks till Mother's Day. We're going to talk about fatherhood specifically today. Being a father means helping your children not just be safe, but it means helping them grow up to be strong, to let them know that you will be with them through everything, that you will walk beside them through every 
dark day and every great day, but it also means that you allow them to be challenged. You allow them to grow because the only way to grow is to be challenged. You allow them to experience the difficulties of this life so that they can grow into the people that God is calling them to be. That's a huge part of father. It's a huge part of parenting in general. And, you, you know, we've been talking about this Trinity stuff and, and God the Father. And as I said at the beginning, it's kind of, it's an article of faith that we understand the Trinity because the math really doesn't work out the right way. So why do we take it as an article of faith? Well, it's because the scriptures say that, that all over from the beginning of time to the end that the triune God is our God, that he is one, that we know him in three persons. But why do we believe that? Well, I, I want to give you something really interesting today as a reminder that even when we investigate nature, when we look scientifically at people and who they are and why they do what we do, we end up seeing the fingerprints of God right there, even in the midst of the scientific endeavor. So, just as a reminder real quick before we get there, love is the source of all creation. Why did God create everything? He created it out of love, that he designed us to be fully alive, and that fatherhood is a personal thing to God. There's this creation being designed. Fatherhood is all part of being loved and sent by God the Father. So how does this work with parenting? All right, A-plus parenting. In, anybody like getting A-pluses in school? Does anybody ever get A-pluses in school? All right, it's okay if you didn't or whatever. We're not, we're not there right now. I don't mean to take you back to memories that you don't want to go to. However, when you become a parent, the very first time you look at that first child that you have, or the first time that you are parenting somebody else's kid or whatever, first time you have a kid in your house on your own, you look at it and you say, what am I doing? <laughs> how can I possibly do this? I don't know how to do this. And you want to be a better caregiver. You want to be a better parent. You want to figure this out, and there's really no book. However, uh, one of the most prominent researchers today in psychology is Angela Duckworth. She wrote a book recently called Grit. She has been doing incredible research over the last 10 years. She got a MacArthur Genius Grant, all this stuff, and she's really uh, fun to listen to. And on a recent episode of Freakonomics, she had an interview with Stephen Levitt, and she talked all about how she's trying to figure out, her, her life goal is to figure out a unified theory of behavior, um, of behavior change. Like, why do people do what they do? How can we, from a psychological standpoint, understand why people do what they do? And she's working on that so hard and collaborating and figuring out all these different things. And they had a whole portion of it where they talked about what does the research say about parenting? How does it all work? And this is what, this is what astounded me when I was listening to it, is that she, what it came down for her from a scientific point of view, from the research that has been done over a century about why people do what they do and how we can raise happy, healthy, productive human beings in this world, these are the two things that are needed to help people flourish and live and grow. Guess what they are? Parents need to give love without condition. What does that mean? How do we say that in church? It's unconditional love. Unconditional love, right? And the second thing, is that parents need to challenge growth in their children toward a purpose. You need to challenge them. It can't be easy. It can't be safe. It has to be difficult. There has to be something to work toward. But in the end, your children need to know that they have a purpose in this world. So what is science telling us today? Scientific research, and there's no such thing as science, but what is research telling us today and about parenting, about how we help kids flourish. They need to be loved unconditionally, and they need to have a purpose in which we are challenging them to grow into. I don't know about you, but this is literally what the Bible has taught me my entire life. This is what God has been teaching his people from the beginning of time, that they are loved unconditionally by him and that he has designed them with and for a purpose in this world. We, as the scientific community, as modern Americans, are finally catching up to what God has already spoken into our hearts and our lives throughout all of the centuries. I, for me, this is huge. 
This reminds me that my relationship with God filters out into this world and needs to filter out into this world in such a way that I get out of the way. But I let other people see who God is through me, that I give love without condition, not just to my kids, but to all the people around me. That I not only challenge, well, that I don't coddle people, that I don't uh, just give them things, but that I challenge them to grow toward the purpose that they have. That everybody has a purpose and they're challenged to grow toward it. That's huge. When we do these things, we are doing what God the Father has done in us. We are showing others who he is. Remember, all throughout the series, we're going to keep reminding you, this is who God has made you to be. This is what you are in this world. You are loved unconditionally. You are sent with a purpose into this world. You are loved more than you can imagine. You are sent for a purpose greater than you know. Make that a reality today. Let that sit in your heart and your mind. And may you see God the Father as the originator of all that, as the creator, the designer, and as the Father.